you have your Bibles, turn to Luke, the 8th chapter. I hope you're thinking there, we're going to get to that in pretty soon. I had the prophecy over me that God wanted to have drilling rights to drill a new well in my heart and be a gusher. And I believe it started taking, really breaking through in October of, or November last year in, in uh, Columbia. And uh, it just, it's continuing yet. I realize I can always cap the thing if I want to, and I don't want to. Hallelujah. Think about this. Dan, um, Joe McCarty posted this the other day on Facebook, and it really touched me. He just said, the average person's going to get 20 to 30,000 days to live. If you had a dollar for every day that you're going to live, and every day you spent that dollar, you're going to spend it on something that's going to be gone. You can't keep it. And uh, for a lot of you right now, you've already spent $15,000, $20,000, Half your funds are already gone for a lot of you. If you live to be 100, you got 36500 right? I do that right? 365 days times uh, 100 years. Yeah, leap years. Oh, Kirk. <laughs> a few extra pennies on the way. By the way, welcome Mary and Celia. That's uh, good to have you guys here. They just come and dropped in. They're going to Countryside over in Spearfish, but good to have them here. We go way back, way back to the early 90s. But uh, here's the deal. When you start looking at it, instead of all these years, just look at it, you know, that you got maybe 15,000 days left. You know, it's not hard to spend $35,000, is it? No. Not hard at all. And every day it goes by, $1 is gone out of your till that will never be replaced. And whatever you bought, whatever you purchased with it will be yours, but whatever you didn't will be faulted. Can't be made, can't be made up. Only you can decide how valuable your day is. Only you can decide how, mo how precious every moment is. Only you can decide whether you waste it with worry, fear, disbelief, anger, disappointment, or if you take it by and rise up and be say, I'm going to be a history maker and make it count. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're at work. It doesn't matter if you're on the golf course. It doesn't matter if you're in jail. It doesn't matter if you're in the hospital. It does not matter. You still only get $1 per day or one day for every day, 24 hours. And, you, and it, it doesn't matter if you're doing a great thing of uh, preaching to a million people in Africa or, you're, or if one person or, or if you're all alone. You have the opportunity to make the most of that day. That's an incredible thought if you ask me. And when I think about that, then it just tells me I just don't need to be mediocre. There's plenty of days. <laughs> I don't, I re, you know, folks, I really don't want to look back and say, you know, I had about 5,000 mediocre days that I just let pass by because I just decided I just was tired. I was walking through the store the other day. I was walking through Lynn's, and it, uh, a lady had a newspaper there, and uh, I just tell you that because that's, that's how your life works. And all of a sudden, you'll just be prompted the Spirit of God says something. And she had her newspaper, and she had her, you know, cup of coffee, and, and you could just tell she was going through that newspaper. And I, I've known people like that, that, that uh, they, read, they read the whole paper. They read the whole paper every day. Some of them just, like Carolyn, she just reads the obituaries. I don't know why she reads the obituaries. I guess waiting for me to die. Just saying, ah, there he goes. There goes John. But uh, me, I, don't, I never know uh, half time when people die because I don't, I don't read the obituaries. I don't read the comics. I don't read the sports page. I don't read the newspaper. That's not to say I'm better or not. I'm just saying. But I'm, as I walk by, I said, wow, God, some people are super informed. He said, yeah. And it's a good thing if you do something with it. And I thought, how many people are super informed and yet have no production in their life? I mean, for, for especially, well, let's put it this way. Super informed about so many things. And I, and I got to admit, I, 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 I love the people that are 
experts in quantum physics, quantum biology, uh, biology, chemistry, electricity, uh, mechanics. Uh, I, I'm impressed. I'm one. I'm a person that gets super impressed with. Uh, I was just in a gun shop the other day here in town, you know, and they're showing me all the tools. I'm. A, I was blown away. I did not know you could weld aluminum now with just spinning a rod on top of it and making the friction so hot that it'll actually weld and not warp anything. I didn't know they had tools like that. I didn't know they had the laser tools that they got today. I didn't know they had the high speed tools that they got today that they can do incredible things. And, and then you get into quantum uh, biology and you start understanding just how a, an individual cell works and how it's all connected. And then the, the idea that it's connected all the time. You can take an electron from a, a water molecule and throw it into outer space and it's still connected. And we don't understand that, but we're just finding out this thing, this concept of connectivity. And there's people that understand it. There are people that understand the computers. They understand and if, and and, and uh Sports, and you just think of the uh, the top 100 people that you know or know about that are extremely brilliant in their area, extremely brilliant. That's a, that's that's incredible knowledge, isn't it? And here's the deal: God originated everything. The word "father" means it says our heavenly Father. It means the one in heaven who has originated everything. You will not find a quantum physics brilliant person who will know more than Jesus. Jesus, he could have the conversation with anybody on the face of the earth in their brilliancy and not be stunned about what they were learning because he made it. He's not ignorant of what he's done. And he has so much more to show us. We're just barely tapping into this thing about the universe, how big it is and how powerful it is. He made it. He knew about it. He knows every detail. He knows every huge thing. And then he knows the future about it. And let me just say this. Can you imagine one person having all that brilliancy? Think about the people that you know that are extremely smart and extremely talented in their areas that ooh and I and some of our, even our sports guys, and, they, and yet here, put them all together in a human body and you got Jesus and more. And when this man walked on the earth, he knew all that. He created all things. Nothing came into existence except through him. He holds it all together. And he was on this earth and he only spent three years in ministry and he spoke and he taught the kingdom of God while he was here. He said, it is now time to preach the kingdom of God. And he went from city to city preaching the kingdom of God. And you and I read it here and it just looks like simple farmer stories. But may I just say, that man knew everything about everything when he told these stories. And he knew that a little child could read these and start getting the milk of the word. And he knew that you and I or anybody that spent their whole lifetime studying the kingdom could still read these stories and get more and more and more insight on how things work. I believe we could raise the value of what he said in those few years, knowing who he is and what he wanted to accomplish. And I don't believe he just shared a few things saying, well, they, they can't understand much. I believe all the secrets of the kingdom he shared. And the depth of it is only up to us on how much we will value it. So I'm going to read to you one of those parables. It starts out in, in uh, Luke 8. It's also in Matthew 13. It's also in Mark 4. Uh, each one has a few little different insights, but I chose today to read out Luke, and we're going to start with the fourth verse. And when a great multitude coming, uh, were coming together... And, and those from the various cities were journeying to him. He spoke by way of a parable. 
Now, most of them say that he got into a boat because there's so many people. And by the way, do you know if you get into a boat and you go out on the water, that when you speak, the, the, the cool water will bring your voice waves down. When it hits the warm dirt, it'll rise up, and it turns into an amphitheater. Probably just a coincidence that they all heard, thousands of people heard him. And this is what he said, The sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. Some fell beside the road, and it was trampled on, underfoot, and birds of the air ate it up. And other seed fell on rocky soil, and soon it, as, it, as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And other seed fell into the good soil, grew up, and produced a crop a hundred times as great. A hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's still calling out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He knew he was speaking to those people. It was valuable for him to come down on earth and speak. It was valuable for him to get out on that boat so all of them could hear. But he also knew that this was going to be recorded and that you and I were going to have opportunity to read it. And to have opportunity for the Holy Spirit to explain it to us. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He was saying, make a choice of what you're going to do. Make a choice on how how much value you're going to place on what I'm saying. Because if you do, more will be added to you. If you don't, even what what you've gained here today will be taken away. He cried out. And his disciples began questioning him as to what the parable might be. And he said to you. And I won't labor this this morning, but uh, for years I thought, well, how come they got to know nobody else? Because they asked. It's not, it's not hard. They asked. If you want to know, ask. And I don't mean ask every professor that you know and ask every pastor you know and every, uh, uh, you can ask them too, but ask him. If you want to know what this means, ask him. He'll tell you. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is, it is in parables, in order that seeing they may see and hearing they may not understand. But the parable is this. And by the way, in Mark 4, he says, How can you, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of the parables. That's why I spend so much time at this parable. This is the foundation. This is the basis of the kingdom of God right here. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. In this parable, he goes out to sow. What's God sowing? He is sowing his word. You know, so often, I don't know what you image with that, but if, your image, if you have an image of a Bible, if you have an image of somebody preaching, but let me, put it, let me just kind of magnify that a little bit, if I may. He put out his thoughts, his feelings of life, his very essence of what makes God God. God is throwing out there, His viewpoint, his paradigm, his understanding. He knows all about quantum physics. He knows all about the cell. He knows all about the universe. He knows all about the stars. He knows all about the power within the human body. He knows all that stuff. And he is casting out, throwing out, throwing it every direction. His word, his being, his makeup, his understanding, his everything. It's a little bit more than just Word. That word is logos, and the Bible said that, that the logos took on a flesh. In other words, everything that made up God, he is sowing. Everything that makes up God and his viewpoint, his power, his understanding, his insight, he is sowing. And those beside the road are those who have heard, and, and then the devil comes and takes it away, takes away the word from their heart. Heart. Matthew says, because they have no understanding. How did you, you get understanding of the, of the uh, English language? How did you learn how to read? How many of you remember learning to read? How that all happened? I don't. I really don't. I don't know how I learned how to read. I, I just don't. You may say, well, because you didn't. Well, I'm working on it. But I remember being in first and second grade, and we had a wonderful teacher there, and I remember seeing the alphabet on the side. I remember going through the alphabet and all that. But all of a sudden, I, you know, I was reading. 
And it still amazes me and our kids to, in school today. You know, I go down and Jody's teaching the alphabet, da, 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 and A makes it sound, ah, ye, ah, you know. You know, and they're, oh, I can't read, you know. And, then, and we get, you know, all of a sudden one day they're reading. All of a sudden you hand them a menu in the restaurant and they read it. All of a sudden they're reading on the signs on the truck. And I go, whoa, how'd that happen? Because they stayed long enough to get understanding. Understanding doesn't happen the first time you see it. Understanding doesn't happen just you know, automatically. You have to stick with it. You have to stick with it. And we noticed with the kids coming back this fall that many of them, they had lost some ground because they had all summer long. How many of you remember being told you're supposed to read books all summer long? Oh, I hated that. We were supposed to do book reports. I can still feel the gut-wrenching feeling, you know, because I, and I, all summer long I had guilt and shame because I didn't read those stupid books, and I read the back page and try to make up a paragraph. <laughs> I'm still doing that today. <laughs> but I will tell you what, I'd be determined to be a person of understanding the kingdom of God. Man, when we sing that song, you know, I'm going to be a history maker. I've declared that before I heard this song. I declared I was going to live for God. I had, I had a hunger for understanding of the kingdom of God, not just something that would please man. I didn't go to seminaries. I didn't go to all those things because I, was, I went to God and asked him, and I, and I wanted to know, and I had a hunger, and I've been persistent with it. And there's been a lot of pressures that come against me, but I've been persistent with it, and so have you, hallelujah. And I have understanding, and this does not apply to me. Well, let me say this. A lot, a lot of people read this parable and they'll relate this only to people getting saved, you know, born again. This is not about being born again only. It works that way. This is about everything in the kingdom of God works this way. Every word of God, every bit of understanding of, uh, uh, of, from God. You know, God wants us to be extremely good scientists. God wants us to understand how, how physics works. God wants us to play with this universe and have dominion over it and just keep on creating better and better things. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad we invented the wheel? <laughs> I mean, to this day, isn't a wheel a blessing? Yes. By the way, if you get understanding, the devil's done taking it away from you. Once you have understanding and insight, he cannot ever take it again. He can yell, scream. He just, I don't know. I haven't seen him for years. So that they may not believe and be saved. That word save is zozo. You know that. It means be delivered, to be healed, to be transformed, to be uh, delivered from mental stress, to be delivered from physical harm, to be delivered from fear, uh, all wrong emotions. That word is not just being born again. That word is... Uh, uh, if you take this word into your heart and believe it, you will be saved. You will be, be winning in everything. Verse 13, and those on the rocky soil are those when they hear, receive the word of God with joy, and they have no firm root, but they believe for a while. And in time, tempt, uh, in the time of temptation, fall away. Mark 4 says, when, when trials and tribulations come to get the word, not to get you, but to get the word. And if you succeed, succeed to that, then it'll be, it'll be taken away. So you, how many people have you saw get all excited, all pumped up because they came into the word of God about his love for them or something, and today you don't see them anymore? You need to have a firm root. It comes the same way of getting understanding. You need to stay with this. And you need to keep the water in the same word. And you need to keep feeding. That's why you keep the same parable here that tells you that how, how you can be born again. is telling you how you can be well established. How you can understand. How you can be solid as a rock. And you take in the same parable to keep that thing fed and to understand it. As many years as I've read this, this thing just continually amazes me how much he's saying in this parable. And then verse 14, and the seed uh, which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard and understand, and as they go on their way, uh, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Now, they may have a complete corn stalk there, but just no fruit. Man, I don't want to be one that gets it snatched away. I don't want to be one that just has a temporal little jump up and down, good, good moment, and then it's gone. And I don't want to be one that has produced the big, the stem, the stock, and brought everything up and then don't finish to get the fruit. All three of those scenarios are something I don't want. I don't think you want them either, do you? 
And there's plenty of examples of all that in our world today. And the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. How many people came to understand that scripture, came to believe it, came to got born again, used it to, to get filled with the Spirit, used it to start growing in God, and yet today might absolutely be stagnant, not bringing much fruit forth. I hope my message today brings some discontentment with your status quo. From the standpoint of just saying, there's so much more. There's so much more. Have you ever felt in your life, don't go religious on me, don't be honest. This works in an honest heart, an open heart. You realize that one of the reasons I've been speaking this to you that, that says, I don't owe God anything, he does not owe me anything, is because if without that, without that perception, you don't have an honest heart relationship with God. You cannot come to God subserviently. Now, I know most people say, well, you need to come humbly. You don't, we're not deserving anything. Listen, you cannot have a relationship with somebody who comes to serve you subserviently and is thinking they're like your, your servant or whatever else. You cannot have an honest, great relationship with somebody unless you can look them eyeball in the eyeball and not be worried and intimidated about what your house looks like, what they're going to find out about you. If you're hiding something from somebody, you know, if, you know like... One of my friends, you know, we were five bachelors living in a little trailer house, and I came home one day, and the guys were acting weird. It prepared me for, for marriage. <laughs> they were acting weird. You know, they were not, you know, they were just acting weird. And finally, I finally said, what is going on? And they were giggling like a bunch of little school kids. And I forget how I found out, but I walked out in the garage, and there was a Harley Davidson. <clears throat> now, you need to understand that, when we, uh, that uh, it has been a calling in my life. It's been what I've been, I've been called to be a leader of leaders, that God uh, put that inside me. As we pray for these dreams, those are the things that God put inside of me. And from an early age in high school, people were coming to me for counsel, and I didn't know what they were coming for or why they were coming. Before I was even uh, bold enough to speak to anybody, while I was still a shy person, uh, kids were coming to me, confiding to me. I actually had teachers that would spent the whole class hour spending time with me, and I couldn't ever figure it out. because. But there was a seed inside of me placed there by God to be a leader of leaders and to be one who gives insight. And so even at an early age, my fire for God, my early days, I was still honest and open to God. I was an innocent kid believing in the best I could. And even then, there was a crop coming up in my life of people drawn from the fruit of what God had placed inside of me. And these five guys that were living with me at that time were, were uh, you know, they were looking to me as a leader. And uh, I was very pragmatic. I was very practical. I was like, guys that stay out of debt, guys that pay our bills, right? Let's, you know, all these practical things. And with a bunch of guys that wanted to do a lot of crazy things. And so they, one of them had bought a Harley and they said, don't tell John. I got the don't tell mom. Don't tell my husband. Don't tell my wife thing. So it takes an honest heart. So when you're in a relationship with God, you've got you to come to him on, on his level. Now, you, you're, you know that you're not God, you know, but you are a child of God. By the way, if you're going to go to a gunfight, don't bring a knife. Me might have it for a spare, but bring a gun. If you're going to come to war in the kingdom of God, bring your God. Bring the God inside you to everything you do. You have God inside of you. Make sure you take him everywhere. Make sure you acknowledge. He's with you anyway, but make sure you, man, use the kingdom that's inside of you. How many of you ever felt like you're being punished? How many of you got situations in life and you just could not figure out why am I the one picked out? Why am I being bullied? 
Why am I always left out? Why does everybody else have so much talent and I have so little? Why can others succeed in business? And I try the same thing that, you know, who hasn't been invited to a multi-level company and I saw little circles drawn on a whiteboard and saying, if I can do it, you can do it. And you're saying, liar, liar. I don't know how you did it, but I tried it and it didn't work for me. I've got this mark on my head. I've got this mark in my life. Good things get real close to me, but just out of my reach. In the same way that the Word of God goes in your heart and will sink roots down, draw in the nutrients what it needs from all over whatever, the universe, whatever it needs to bring. A seed knows what it needs, and if it's in good soil, it will go send out the roots as far as it needs to go to get what it needs to bring forth the crop, to bring forth the stem and all that. And so every word, image, viewpoint, paradigm that you and I have is going to do that. And the God says, this is the way the kingdom of God works. It goes into a heart and produces, and it'll produce produce a hundred times more than what you even planted in there but he also said in, in Matthew he said but I've sown the good things but there's been an enemy when I went to sleep that sowed the evil things into people's hearts and in the same way that this that God's viewpoint his heart his his intellect his insight will can go into your heart it's the same way that evil can come into your heart and they both will produce crops right now Turn with me to Romans, the 8th chapter. <clears throat> How many of you ever said out of your mouth, I just don't win things? Go to sign up for a lottery. I mean, not a lottery, but just sign up for some... I was prize drawing or whatever. Oh, I never win. How many of you ever said that? Is that what you want? This. I can't. I, uh. Lots of people are angry at God. Because of what they have in life. You know something? I've always tried to tell them it's not God's fault. But today, I repent. You're absolutely right. You have every right to be angry at God. And I'm not just trying to preach here. I'm actually, I, this morning, I have seen something I've never seen before. Yeah, at least in a way that I'm not seeing it like I'm seeing it now. I, I really did. I've always felt kind of wishing I could help somebody who is ticked off at God. Because I meet a lot of people who are really ticked off at God. And I thought, you know, it's pretty hard to have a relationship with a guy that you're mad at, isn't it? But the truth is, it is his fault. You have every right to be mad. Because everything originated with God. And he's the one that set this up and the creator of the universe that knows all things. That's, by the way, man, it, learn science, learn biology, learn all that you can because it's so much fun because you get to talk to people that know that subject and it's the easiest thing in the world to lead them with God because God created it all and he made it. Man, there's no enemy between God and science. The only thing, the only, if there's a, an obstruction between science and God, it's only the liars. It's people that are declaring things as true science that aren't true science. By the way, all this global warming we had, did you just all of a sudden notice that the, the Arctic pole is freezing at a super fast rate? So we're having a little cool down, which is also caused by the global warming. True science points to nothing but God because it came out of him. 
I love science. I, I love to talk science. I love to go be with a scientist because even if they got a wrong perception of God, they got a right perception of a few things in science. And if I can see what they see, then I go, wow, it just shows me how amazing God is. And by the way, when I quit fighting with them, they started actually wanting to hear what I had to say. You have a right to be mad at God for where your life is at if you didn't get picked for the team, if you didn't get the best grades in school, if your body isn't quite where you want to be, if you you don't have the mental capacity. You have a right to be upset with Him because He's the one that set it up that said whatever you sow in the heart is going to produce a crop. He's the one that set that up. And it doesn't fail. And there are no exceptions. So if you want to be mad at God, you've got every right. But be mad at Him for the right thing. He didn't pick cancer and throw it on you. He picked a system of how the kingdom was going to work. And it works every time. Where'd you go? Romans 8? There is therefore now... When? Now. Yesterday? Tomorrow? Now. There is therefore now. What? No. How much? No. None. Zero. Zip. He means this in the Greek. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. There are two laws working. They both work. The kingdom of God works of bringing, taking in the love of God in your heart, and it will produce a crop. You can take in evil, and it will produce. There are two, there are two, and they both work in the human heart. And there is therefore, because Christ paid the price, and because Christ, Christ did all that he did, went to the grave, rose up, went to heaven, sent forth his Holy Spirit, there is therefore now, when? Now, no condemnation. Let me read to you a def- some definitions of condemned. Condemn, to express an unfavorable or di- diverse judgment on. To indicate strong disapproval. Have you ever felt a strong disapproval of your life? Do you ever wake up and just in the morning just say, I don't think anybody approves of me. Man, I can go back to moments and decades of feeling disapproval from my parents, from the church, from my friends, from from the workplace. Here's another definition. To pronounce to be guilty, sentenced to punishment. You know, there are people every day that wake up and feel a sentence on them, a punishment. I'm being punished. I don't know what I did wrong. We have songs about it. We preach it from the pulpit. We hear it in school. You're being punished. You must have done something wrong. Condemned. To judge or pronounce to be unfit for use or service. Have you ever felt unfit to be used by God? One of my dear friends had an opportunity talking to a neighbor. He was a farmer. He's talking to his neighbor, and he just and the neighbor starts to share about man. You know, I, you know, da 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 da. He said, I was just thinking the other day, life's got to be more than just farming. Life's got to be more than just living and dying. And he just opened the door to say, I'm wondering what life is all about. He was so hungry, and, he, and, and my friend, I said, wow, did you just share the gospel with him? He says, no. He said, you know, I never went to college, to Bible college. It just didn't feel adequate. To this day, I want to I I do something. Cry, shout, strangle. Who told you you were unfit? Who told you you'd be more fit if you went to Bible college? Who told you that you couldn't, you were unfit for the preaching of this God? Who told you you... 
And then I've talked to others that say, well, I was going to share with them, but you know, I have this bad habit of smoking, cussing, chewing, drinking. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not fit. So you're going to withhold this, uh, this awesome opportunity a person has to receive an image from God as something that could change their whole life, but you're going to disqualify yourself and, 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 and therefore let those people walk on without that word being sown in because you, you judge, you, you're judged unfit. We condemn a building so it's unfit for use. How many people don't feel fit to study? How don't, don't feel fit to live? Don't feel, don't feel qualified to go to make money? Do you realize if you keep trying to make money, but in your heart you have a crop growing that says you're unfit, not worthy, being punished, not, not, not capable. It doesn't matter how many things you do right in the natural realm, you will not prosper. Because you got, this is how the kingdom works. It doesn't work out here in the natural. It works in here in the heart. This is how Jesus, the man who made everything, the man that knows quantum physics, the man that understands every little detail about everything, said, this is the way the kingdom works. And if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand anything that I do. And you're going to feel rejected. And you're going to feel like you're separated. And you're going to feel like there's some sort of magical system out there that you don't know how to turn the key. You're going to feel like some people are just dang lucky and I'm not and you're going to disqualify yourself and no matter how hard then you're going to say I'm going to bust through and make money anyway and no matter how hard you try it doesn't work why? because he said the goal comes out of here and we got people super informed reading their paper reading their books getting their degrees and yet know absolutely very little about the kingdom of God oh I know that parable oh I heard that when I was in Sunday school do you have any understanding how powerful this is? And if you do, well, let me ask you this. Out of the days that you have left, how many of them are going to be spent seeking to understand the kingdom of God or how many are going to be spent making a living Let me read you another definition. Condemned. To force into a specific state or activity. Example, his lack of education condemned him to a menial job. You ever felt forced? Forced to be where you are today in your marriage, in your family and your job there is therefore now no condemnation all that I've been reading there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus there is no falling short there is no being disqualified There is no being separated and being punished. There's no sentence on you. You know, the whole world's philosophy is, so many of them are saying, well, the karma, you know, I, I wish I could see in the future and see what's going to happen to me. You got to be kidding. You, that, does, that doesn't work that way at all. God has plans, but every plan has to be executed by this. Every plan of God that he has for you has to be brought into existence by this, not by just showing up to earth and being here, and not by just doing a few things, and not by just showing up to church and doing communion. Every plan that God has inside of you has to be that you receive it from God. You get an image of it. You get to see what it's like, and you water it, and you nurture it, and you take care of it. And then every plan that even is that's going on, you have to figure out how to keep it from being choked out so that it can bear fruit. You... You have to start understanding, how, okay, you now know that just being busy in life can choke out the very thing that you want in life. 
And you have every right to be bitter at God at your age and saying, I thought I'd be farther along than that because you, you have every right to be bitter because he set this system up that says, if you take in my word and you get some hope and you get, you get excited about life, but then if you get so worried about the everyday cares of life and how your body looks and how your mind looks and how everybody views you, then he will choke it out and he'll never bring the fruit. And you have every right to be mad at God because he set it up. And he doesn't break it for anybody. But you need to understand this. It is not his will that you be condemned. It is not his will that you feel insignificant. It is not his will that you, that you write yourself off. It is not his will that you feel like you're being punished. He said, that thing of condemnation that was sown into you, it's not for me. And in fact, I sent my son to destroy that seed in your life. What would happen if we could choke out this condemnation that's in our hearts. You know how you choke it out? You plant the good thing and you just take care of the good thing. And you take care of that and you look at that scripture and you go, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And you meditate and you ran and you say it over and over. You do whatever you got to do to get that just around your heart, to get it watered all the time until it chokes out every feeling that you're marked and that you can't make it and that because of your screw-ups or because somebody else's screw-ups, you know, you, you know, say you want a family and, and, and you don't have a family. I tell you what, God says literally, I'll give you the family that you've always dreamed of. Even if the natural is gone, I'll give you. I'm telling you, it, what really counts is, is what you believe in your heart. And how much emphasis do we put? We're here on earth. We got maybe 30,000 days here on earth. And we put all of our focus on this temporal world instead of on the eternal thing that we're going to live forever. Is, that, is there any logic in that? Well, I have to go to work. I have to have a job. No, you don't. Because if you spend the time in this and where you really believe what God has for you and you get that crop growing, I guarantee you your finances will come. I guarantee you you'll get the job that you really need to be in. You may suffer a little harm for a while. There's trials and tribulations that come to take it. There's all kinds of enemies that try to steal this thing from you. And they all seem legitimate if you give a lot of significance to the temple. And if you can't live uncomfortable for a little while. But if you take the time to say, God, this is what I want. This is out of the kingdom. I'm tired of being mad at you. I want to be now grateful for that you gave me a way out of everything. You showed me how I can win at everything. You've showed me the keys. You've given me the mystery of the kingdom of God. That it's all about what I sow in my heart. And the last one is, definition is to declare incurable. The enemy is constantly sowing seeds in our heart every day in this world system. There's constant seeds being thrown in us, and one of them is you're incurable. And it's not just about cancer. It's not just about heart attack. Sometimes it's, it's incurable. Your, 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 your plight in life is incurable. You're condemned. You've already been sentenced to, to failure. Come on, be logical about it. You can't win. You don't have what it takes. And I hear people say, I hear teachers saying that to kids sometimes. I love it when they bust through it. There's a battle going on. Bring the sword of the Spirit. When Jesus preached this, I think he knew that out of those 5,000 people, there wouldn't be very many that would make it to full crops. But you know something? He also knew that you and I were going to read it today. And he's still believing for those who actually turn away from all natural things and know how the kingdom works and excel. We sing that song not just because it's got a good beat and got good words. I'm going to be a history maker. I'm going to change the world I live in. Who's got the guts? Who's got the perseverance? Who's got the desire? 
Most don't. Most will let this, the everyday occurrences of life talk them out of having a supernatural God life. I was watching uh, Titans. Is that the return? No, what? Remember the Titan? What's the one about the cr- release the Kraken? Kraken, huh? Clash. Yeah, okay. You're off there. I, was, I misled you. Anyway, Percy had uh, was born of a God and man, and uh, but he wanted to live just as a man. Anyway, they're headed to a battle, and one of the guys says, you have a God inside, you bring him with you. And I just heard that, and I go, mm, mm. how can I feel like a victim? How can I feel like I've been sentenced to punishment? How can I feel like I'm never going to win? How can I, when I got a God inside of me? It's whatever I want to focus on. You know, that's why sometimes it's important to get up I remember Cliff Cord once got up and testified how he believed in healing and believed in God and declared a healing. And uh, I saw him about three days later, and he said, well, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> I said, how come? He said, I've been sick ever since. It's like, don't stand up because the devil can see, and you'll just take, you know. And I say, stand up and say, take your best shot because I'm coming through anyway. This cowardlessness will not get you anywhere. The, the righteous are bold as a lion. And I was thinking about Mike when we declare our shots. You know, if we declared our shots every time, what we, what we actually planned, we'd be more focused. Because sometimes I get up and I just swing, hoping it's out there someplace safe. You know, that's kind of just a, you know, there's times, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're doing, and so you may say, well, I don't want to be one of those people that jumps up and says, I'm going for God, and then, and then dies out. That's that one they received it with joy and all that. But listen, you, gotta, you still got to do that, but then you just stay and you just say, I don't care how many times I get hit. I'm going to get up until my last breath. I'm going to, I'm going to be a history man. I'm going to know God. I'm going to know the kingdom. I want, to, I want to understand these things. I want to understand physics, not because I'm going to be teaching it, not because I'm going to be using it someplace, anyplace else. I want to know it because I want to know God. I want to know how to live as a God-man. Would you stand, please? It's not talking about determination with your head. It's not talking about using your willpower. It's talking about your heart. the closing seconds that we have here you got one dollar to spend today you got a few cents right now to spend can you give it focus for a few seconds here on your heart and say what's in my heart what do I want in my heart you do not have the power or the right, or the privilege to control what grows in your heart. You only have the right, the privilege, and the authority of what you let take root, what you let be sown into it. That seed will get into that soil, and it, with the soil, will produce itself. By the way, you let this feeling of condemnation into your heart, and all of us have that, by the way, sown into us from the time we're born. It came with the fall of Adam. It was a package given in your heart from the moment you're conceived. But it doesn't just produce one or two. It produces a hundredfold return in all areas of your life. But you now have the secrets of the kingdom of God to know how to let God plant in your heart 
the truth that there is therefore now no condemnation for you. Without exception, there is no condemnation for you. And as that crop grows, it will produce and it will choke out the condemnation. It will root it up. It will cast it out. You can be, your heart can be free from it. And look at what can happen when a heart is free from being sentenced to death and with an incurable, no hope prognosis. Father, I thank you for the word today. Dear God, you're amazing. Heavenly Father, you are so awesome. You're awesome in the fact that you made all this, created all this, put it, in a, you put it in motion when you created the earth. But you're really awesome that you gave us the opportunity to understand it. To take the authority of our life and our, of our life and start sowing in and opening up our heart to the things that are truth, that are real, that are love, and that are good. You are awesome. To look at man and say, I'm going to give them the opportunity to live just like me. To live just like me. And use the same weaponry and use the same insights that I use. God, and we're hungry for the information and the transformation and the acting out of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.